All right, so I want to welcome everyone back. This is going to be video number two for chapter nine. Now, please remember that we are going to break chapter nine into three videos. The first one dealt with glycolysis. The second one, this one, is going to deal with the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. And the third video is going to deal with the electron transport chain, and we're also going to throw fermentation into that third video as well. Now, if you remember from video number one, we had talked about the 10-step process of glycolysis. And remember that glycolysis took place in the cytosol or the cytoplasm um, of the cell. Now remember that the end product of glycolysis was two three-carbon pyruvate molecules. So we had taken that original six-carbon glucose and broke it down into these two pyruvate or sometimes called pyruvic acid molecules. Now what we need to do next is we need to basically get this pyruvate into an organelle found within the cell and that organelle is going to be the mitochondrion. Now if you notice in the mitochondrion looking at its structure we have an outer membrane and we have another membrane called the inner membrane and so it's really important for this pyruvate to be able to make its way through both of these membranes. Now the only way that it can actually do that is by having a transport protein actually help it across the membrane. Now one thing that is necessary to get this pyruvate across the membrane is it is considered active transport so it does require a little bit of energy on the part of the cell to get this pyruvate across that membrane. So once we get the pyruvate, this three carbon molecule across the membrane, then what we need to do is we need to prepare it for the Krebs cycle. Now remember the Krebs cycle is just another name for the citric acid cycle. So what we have to do is we have to basically transform the pyruvate into another compound and this compound is going to be acetyl coenzyme A. So this is considered the preparatory stage for the Krebs cycle. Now, as you notice, during the preparatory stage, we're going to transform again the pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, but we have the production of a couple of products. And if you notice up here, this is a product that should be familiar to you because it was also produced during glycolysis. So if you notice, the NAD plus has actually been reduced to NADH. So remember that NADH is considered an electron carrier, so we're going to be carrying energy, um, again, from the production of this molecule, from the Krebs cycle actually to the electron transport chain. Very similar to what we had seen in glycolysis for the NADH that was produced there. Now another thing that's also produced during this preparatory stage is the production of CO2. So if you think about respiration, if you think about breathing, we take in O2 and we produce CO2. This is where you're going to get the bulk of the production of CO2. So this is where the CO2 comes from that we actually breathe out. Now you're also going to notice that we have a special enzyme called coenzyme A that's actually part of the name of this new product that is necessary to allow us to be able to produce acetyl-CoA. Now once we have the production of acetyl-CoA, what we're going to do is we're going to take this product and actually move into the Krebs cycle. So in the diagram that I have on the right, this is just another um, look at sort of the preparatory stage, again, of, of preparing that pyruvate so we can transform it into acetyl-CoA so it could actually make its way through the Krebs cycle. And this right here is actually the bulk of the cycle. Remember, this is just preparatory. The citric acid cycle has eight total steps within the cycle. And during those eight steps, we're going to have three different products that we're going to produce. Actually, we have four different products that we're going to produce. One of those we've already mentioned, which is going to be CO2. Again, it's CO2 that we breathe out. Another one is going to be the NADH. Again, those electron carriers that we had mentioned. It's going to carry energy to the electron transport chain. We are going to produce some ATP during the citric acid cycle, but we're also going to produce a brand new electron carrier that's going to function exactly the same as the NADH. It's just another way to carry high energy electrons to the electron transport chain so we can produce the bulk of the ATP that the cell is going to need. So if you notice over here on the left, um, we're going to have a new word. It's called the mitochondrial matrix. So in the previous slide, we had talked about the inner and the outer mitochondrial membrane. Once you get into the mitochondrion, the Krebs cycle actually occurs within the matrix of the mitochondrion. Now, if I was to draw a mitochondrion, and I'll do my best to do that right here, remember, again, we have a double membrane structure, so an inner and outer membrane. I'm not going to draw the inner membrane. But if you remember, the mitochondrion sort of looks like this, and so we have various folds within that mitochondrion. The Krebs cycle is going to occur within those folds, and that's considered the matrix of the mitochondria. 
The folds that you see are called the cristae, and that's where you're going to have the third stage of cellular respiration um, called the electron transport chain take place. Now, throughout this cycle, we're going to get the production, as I said, of some CO2, some NADH, some ATP, and some FADH2. So if you notice on the right, from one pyruvate molecule that enters the system via acetyl-CoA, we're going to get one ATP produced, three NADHs, one FADH2 per turn. So remember that there's actually two turns of this Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle because remember at the end of glycolysis we produced two pyruvates not just one and so this cycle is going to turn twice. So what we're going to do next is we're going to go through the eight steps that you would find in the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. Now remember that we had that preparatory stage, so at the very top we have the product, which is that acetyl-CoA that we're going to start the cycle off with. So you're going to notice as the acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle, it's going to first combine with oxaloacetate. When it combines with this particular molecule, it's going to form something called citrate. Sometimes you can call citrate citric acid. They're both one and the same. Now you're going to notice that that citrate is going to transition into something called isocitrate. Now these two molecules are actually isomers of each other. So remember an isomer has the same exact chemical formula, but the arrangement of those atoms is going to be a little bit different when you compare the two. Now you're also going to notice during this transition from citrate to isocitrate, we have the input of water, but we also have the release of water. So another thing to be aware of as we go through and we talk about each of the steps is I want you to make sure that you keep track of the number of carbons and the number of hydrogens that you find in each of these different molecules. So as we transition from citrate to isocitrate, remember they're isomers, so the number of carbons is going to remain the same. And in this case, we have six carbons. We have one, two, three, four, five, and then six down here at the bottom. And if you were to count them up in isocitrate, it should be exactly the same. Now I do want to back up just really quick. Remember acetyl-CoA only had two carbons, but the oxaloacetate actually had four carbons. And so that's where you get your total of six carbons in the citrate molecule on the right. So then as we go through and we look at isocitrate, we're going to transition and basically change or make something called alpha-ketoglutarate. And if you notice, again, as we make this alpha-ketoglutarate, we're going to have a couple of products being produced. And one of those products is going to be CO2. So if you notice, we're losing a carbon. And if you also notice, we're going to lose a hydrogen as well, because if you notice, the NAD plus is going to be reduced to that electron carrier called NADH. And so again, if we were to count these up, remember there were six carbons in isocitrate. Down here for alpha-ketoglutarate, we'd have one, two, three, four, five. So it's really good to make sure you're trying to keep track of these carbons and these hydrogens. Now as we make our way from alpha-ketoglutarate all the way down to succinyl coenzyme A, what you're going to find is that we have, again, some products being produced. We have CO2, so we're going to lose another carbon, and we're also going to lose a hydrogen as well. So we have NAD, again, plus being reduced to NADH, that electron carrier. And again, if we count, we had one, two, three, four, five carbons. Now we have one, two, three, four carbons in this molecule. And we also actually have another molecule uh, right here called coenzyme A with a little S next to it that's going to also temporarily attach. And, if, and so if you notice, we're also going to have another molecule that's going to enter the cycle. It's called coenzyme A that's going to be added to the system. And that's going to be temporarily attached to this succinyl coenzyme A. But again, just keeping track of your carbons, again, we started with five, now we've made our way down to four. Now this succinyl coenzyme A is going to transition to something called succinate. And if you notice that extra molecule that we had temporarily attached to this molecule is now going to be removed. But you're also going to notice we have the production of another molecule called guanosine triphosphate. And if you notice, this molecule is going to basically transform into GDP, which is guanosine diphosphate. What you need to know about this molecule is simply that it pretty much is the equivalent to ATP. Again, ATP is going to be a source of energy for the cell. The cell can also use GTP as well. So we have this basically transitioning to this, so it's going to give up that phosphate to become diphosphate. 
utilize that energy within our system, but then we do have the production of an ATP between these two steps. So now if you notice from succinate to fumarate, we actually again have a production of an electron carrier, but this time this electron carrier is brand new. It's called FADH2. And again, if you're tracking your carbons, here we had one, two, three, four. If you look at succinate, we have one, two, three, four, because we haven't had a release of a carbon. But here, again, we still have one, two, three, four, because we don't have CO2 produced, we simply have the production of the FADH2. But we are losing a couple of hydrogens. And if you notice in fumarate, we only have two hydrogens present right here. But then you notice as we transition from fumarate to malate, we have the addition of water. Now when you add that water, you're adding two hydrogens. And so if you look at the addition of this molecule, we have one, two, three, and four hydrogens. And so all the hydrogens are accounted for. We have not had a change in the number of carbons. We still have four because we haven't had anything requiring carbon that has been produced. So then if you transition from malate to oxoaliacetate, we have one final electron carrier that's going to be produced. So again, that NAD plus is going to be reduced to NADH. And then we're back to where we started from. Again, this is the Krebs cycle. It is considered a cycle. So it doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. We just make our way back around. And the second acetyl-CoA that's going to make its way in is going to combine with that oxoaliacetate, and it's going to make its way through the cycle one more time. So again, remembering pyruvate, there were two that were produced during glycolysis, so that would mean we would have the production of two acetyl-coenzyme A's going into the system. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are keeping track of the numbers of NADHs, CO2s, ATPs, and this new electron carrier called FADH2. And I also want you to think about not only what was produced during the Krebs cycle, but also what was produced during the preparatory stage as well. So if you remember, during the preparatory stage, we produced one CO2. In the Krebs cycle, we produced one, two CO2s. So that's gonna give us a total of three CO2s that have been produced. When we look at NADHs, during the preparatory stage, we had one NADH produced. In the Krebs cycle, we have one, two, three. And so that's going to give us a total of four NADHs being produced during both parts of this cycle. And then if you look at the numbers of um, FADHs being produced, this is only produced during the Krebs cycle. And again, this is our brand new electron carrier. So we only have one Fa. DH2 that has been produced. And then lastly, we have ATP, and we only have one ATP that has been produced because we did not have ATP produced during the preparatory stage. But remember, this is only one turn of the cycle. Remember that there were two pyruvate molecules that were produced, so we have two acetyl coenzyme A's that will actually enter the cycle. So if you look at the total, we need to make sure that we double this number. So that would give us six CO2s. That would give us a total of eight NADHs, a total of two FADH2s, and that would give us a total of two ATPs that were produced during the Krebs cycle. All right, so that's going to finish up our second screencast for Chapter 9. Please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide.